Larry, great. Welcome back to our podcast. It's good to have you here again. Thanks. It's great to be back. I have a really serious and important industrial internet security question for you. Now, now you're scaring me. <laughs> yeah, it should be scary. Okay. Is a honeypot real? <laughs> Are we talking philosophically or physically? <laughs> <laughs> I saw a thing on TV about building fake targets for hackers. Yep. And then it was called the honeypot. Yes. It's a real, real thing. It's a real thing. Absolutely. Thank goodness. Cause this was going to be a rough episode if it wasn't. <laughs> well, if you go look at Shodan actually, and you look up, uh, say, a uh, manufacturer like Rockwell or Siemens or something like that, they try hard to get the, sh the honeypots off the targets that'll come back. But the reality is some of what you're going to see out there are going to be honeypots, uh, either <laughs> legitimate honeypots, meaning that it's some manufacturer that's trying to lure you away from the actual target or honeypots that some of the labs use for research to kind of see what you might do if an, if an adversary gets into something. See, this is exactly where I was going. Do I have to be a lab to set this up? No, you can do it at home. I, I think I want to do it at home. <laughs> and I'm, I'm a little bit, I'm a little, so I don't literally want to do it at my home because I'm a little bit worried about talking about a honeypot publicly then po posting the details of the honeypot that I'm going to build uh, and then leaving a record for all time. If, if you leave a, you don't need to post the data for sure. You just put a, you put a rich target out there of some kind. I mean, it doesn't have to be anything super, whatever, uh, just something that looks interesting. And I promise you somebody will find it. it. Okay. So let's back up a little bit for someone who's not a cybersecurity knowledgeable person. First of all, Terry, have you heard of a honeypot before? Oh Yeah. Yeah, Winnie the Winnie the Pooh made him famous. <laughs> Have Absolutely. you heard of a honeypot in this context? <laughs> yes. Can you describe it for us from yeah. zero? <clears throat> it's uh, it's basically, I don't know, like a it, you leave something on a network that appears to be a vulnerability that a hacker might mistake or or take as a vulnerability intentionally so you lure them into a specific spot of your network as larry mentioned to either see what they would do if they did get in so you can you know increase your perimeter or security or whatever um or you know just to to have them work really hard at something that's a, a deterrent from the actual network and they're i think they're they're used that way as well so, yeah, yeah. And, and to take that really as a second part, what some people will do if it's a manufacturer, for example, of a honeypot out there behind their uh, actual public IP address, if if they find someone as an adversary in that, they'll actually block them at the firewall at that point. So they use it as a way to find adversaries that they can then keep out of their network using other um, other controls like a firewall. I want to take I want to build one of these things and I want to do it. Because I'm because I'm nervous about my own lack of knowledge in this space and everything I said before about being public about making a target. I I want to build one that is designed to figure out what sort of filthy automatic stuff would be going after an industrial system. So this is think think botnets or plain Jane viruses. Um, the stuff that the stuff you read about things that are basically living on a variety of IOT devices and then using the IOT devices connection to the internet and processing to essentially sort of just churn through this propagation of, of malware, which is all just set up for a future exploit. It's not, so, so even what Terry was saying about a person, an, an attacker, it's not exactly that there's an attacker on the network. It's that there is the, the prerequisites for an attacker to then expose part of the network. And I feel like that's closer to my level of comfort with saying, Hey, I've made, I'll just, I'll pick a random one. I've made a fake, um, mm. nuclear power plant. It's probably a terrible example. Cause I feel like it would be slightly obvious that it wasn't a real nuclear power plant. So that's a coal fired think, power plant. Yeah, there you go. I think someone might be onto you on that one, but go ahead. <laughs> so, so I build a fake coal power fi uh, power plant. And all I, I feel like all I need to do to make that look right for, for an, for for a bot is have the data tagged correctly, have the overall architecture look the same as it would in a plausible scenario and have it, you know, run windows XP unpatched or whatever the, you know, likely operating system would be. And then, and then once you have this fake thing, then you basically say, well, did it get, 
did it get virus X, Y, or Z? Uh, and then look at all the, the gross stuff and then say, over this amount of time, I saw these things show up on my, on my, you know, pseudo network. Yeah. I mean, the big thing would be making sure that it is in a separate zone away from the rest of your, if you're going to do it at home, for example, away from the rest of your house, you don't want to, to encourage an adversary to have free access to the rest of your home. Right. So make sure well, this is, this is my next question. I literally, my home is a terrible place to do this. I want, I want this to do nothing to do with my home. <laughs> okay. Unless there's, so I was, where, what are my choices here? I mean, I could put a dedicated network in my house with a, I don't know, a separate ISP that's not my main network, or I could insulate the network in my house. All of these sound terrifying to me. So a couple of options, right? You could actually go buy a, a firewall, like a, a Palo Alto little PA220 or something like that, and set up different zones off that firewall, and then have one of those zones be your honeypot, essentially using your existing ISP. Um, or you could, to your point, right, you could go actually um, get a, a network connection from another uh, service provider of some kind, essentially a cable modem, whatever, and do it just behind that. Uh, and then your other option would be to do it totally virtually in the cloud, right? Just go uh, get some space from Amazon or something like that and stand a honeypot up in, in AWS. Um, the problem with those would be you're going to have some of their own controls, essentially keeping adversaries out. So that's probably not going to work as well, but you could certainly do something like that. And I would imagine, and I've never done this truthfully, but um, if you get out on the dark net, I'm sure you can find space out there that you could rent that uh, would give you the opportunity to do some things like this too. And last thing I'll mention is there are some pre-built virtual ICS like honeypots out there that you can uh, can go get. Unfortunately, the names of all of them are escaping me at the moment, but I could send you back an email with some links. And I don't know if you post on the chat or what you might do. I could figure uh, it out. Those lines. Is that, are, we, are they expensive though? Like we're, am I no, going to spend no, some, some, of these even, for that? some of these are even open source. I mean, they're all virtual stuff running an open box or something like that, essentially. So. Uh, if you want real hardware, they're going to get expensive because now you're going to have to go actually buy a you know, PLC off of eBay or a DCS off eBay or whatever, essentially, to, to have I feel that comfortable. Speed. I feel comfortable with the first attempt at this being a sub $500 eBay purchase for real okay. hardware, and I wouldn't go for real hardware until I've tested it in software. Terry, you yeah. were going to ask something, sorry. No, I was just going to ask, is this a, is Honeypot Development a white hat service that any of the white hat providers offer? Not that I'm aware of, but that doesn't mean it's not. Um, that's an interesting question, actually. Uh, I would imagine that you could find some white hat folks, some MSPs out there that probably would provide a honeypot as part of a service for protecting or defending your infrastructure. But I can't tell you I've ever seen that in anybody or heard that from anybody that I've talked to. MSP is a managed service provider? <clears throat> yes, sir. Sorry. <laughs> and that that's IT for hire, essentially, or something else? Yeah, so it could be IT for hire. It is IT for hire to an extent, but you you may take a portion of your IT department and, and outsource it to an MSP. So, for example, the defense of your network um, or something along those lines. Or in this case, the literal non-defense of my network. In this case, the literal, well, I don't know. I mean, you know, there's legitimate use cases for a, honey, for a honeypot from a defense perspective. So you could argue that putting it out there is a legitimate method that you're using to defend your network. Do you make it you... easy, right? Because you lure the guy. Think, 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 honey, right? Bees are yeah, are attracted to honey, so you're literally attracting the adversary to some place you want him to go instead of the places you don't want him to go. Do you remember when you said you were scared of the question? <laughs> yes. Now I'm scared because well, I feel like a little knowledge is the most dangerous of all knowledge. And now I feel like this whole thing was leading up to well, if it's possible for me to do this. I almost have a philosophical obligation to follow through, at least to try it. And then I get really worried because I, I really don't feel like I know what I'm doing here. Is this a case where trial by fire is an acceptable path forward? Or should I go find someone who is more knowledgeable in this than me to help out? So I think you definitely want to be super careful as to how much you might expose your home network to something like this, right? That's, that's the piece of this that would make me nervous for somebody that doesn't really have any idea what they're doing. I got um, that cellular. I'm just going to, I'm just going to buy a SIM card. <laughs> there you go. Put it, put it on hotspot and have at it. Just for the record, every time I check one of the boxes of having the answer, it doesn't make me feel better. It makes me feel worse because <laughs> I'm picturing when I hit that wall of getting the answers wrong and how catastrophic the results could be here. 
Well, the, the beauty of it is if it's on a separate ISP or something like that, you just delete it all and start over. <laughs> yeah, but how the we, Terry and I spent a long time last week and the week before talking about knowledge and skill building and experience. And the thing that scares me the most is the stuff I don't know. And, and like not knowing, oops, this is the part where I've walked from the edge of the cliff to now I'm currently falling. And I don't really realize that I'm falling until I look around and notice the world whizzing by. Yeah, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying. The other side of that, for me at least, has been that, you know, you start thinking about anything that you might do in life. The first time you do it is always the first time you do it. You've you got to make a risk-based decision. Do I step off the cliff, so to speak, expecting there to be a step down there? Versus uh, the catastrophic, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm now falling down a, a hundred foot, you know, rock face. But at the same time, I, I think when you, you learn more from your mistakes than you learn when you're successful, right? At least for me, that's been true in my life. Did you ever so, play with uh, dangerous chemicals or matches under your parents' bed or anything like that growing up? <laughs> Occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> Occasionally, to be brutally honest, yes. I mean, we used to start fires at uh, Boy Scouts when I was a kid with chemicals. I'll just leave it at that. I don't, I don't want to give too much detail because I don't want to encourage some 13-year-old that might happen across this to go do it. But. Do you do you have any idea growing up where and how I grew up? Do you have any idea how many grills I've seen lit with gasoline? Oh, yeah. Gr gr yeah. <laughs> Tons. That's oh, that, I, I may or may not have actually thrown uh, uh, kerosene into, into a kerosene. grill instantly, trying to get it to, get, to, get it to roll a little faster. Yeah, yeah. Do you guys have any idea what that does to the flavor of your food? Well, it cooks as, off. It, in, in this case, there wasn't any food on it yet, so I just kind of let it burn for a while before I put anything on it. So this, Larry, this doesn't sound like a when you were a kid situation anymore. No, it wasn't. This was recent. <laughs> I couldn't get some. I couldn't get some old charcoal going, so it needed an accelerant. <laughs> One of the most embarrassing things that ever happened to me. I was a. I was a pretty proficient griller at the time, not anymore. Uh, but at my wedding, which was a, which was sort of like a getaway to a, a large house situation, there was a, a charcoal grill that needed lighting, and I couldn't get it to light, and I didn't have my stuff. And then my brother-in-law ended up spending like twenty-five minutes getting that charcoal lit. And I was like, that's supposed to be a thing I'm good at. I wouldn't say that's, I wouldn't say that's when I stopped grilling, but it definitely, you know, I had like the glory of becoming uh, a married man and, and taking this next step in my life. And I also had that dagger in the heart of not being able to start a fire. <laughs> it's, it's always embarrassing when you can't do something that you think you ought to be able to do, right? Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> so, so Larry, if I'm, it, it, just like a for clarity on the security situation, whether personal or uh, an ICS, an industrial network. If somebody really wants in, are they getting in? More than likely. I'd love to tell you that they're not. I mean, you know, the places where it becomes much more difficult would be places that have high levels of security controls and a lot of one way diodes and things of that nature. Kind of, you know, back to our history with. Uh, some of the things we used in the past, you can certainly make it very difficult, but you can't make it impossible because even in those situations, right? If I if I can turn an insider, then I can still get in. So it's it's really it's a matter of how committed somebody is to getting in and how committed you are to finding them before they spend any time in your environment. Terry, yeah. you're talking about getting into the network <clears throat> or getting into a physical place? Into a network. I get, I get so twisted and confused about network versus physical, you know, say there's a bank vault and I want to get in. Well, if I get into the network, but it's a network controlled vault, then, or the security camera is network controlled, then into the network allows me physical access. But if it's a, a coal fired power plant and I want to get into the network of the coal fired power plant, one of the ways in is to get into the plant physically and plug a USB drive in. So that like the, the, what would be a, you know, the boundary between physical and network it, it just it's just all of this action at the boundary and i end up being totally confused regularly about are we talking about physical or not physical well and you, you start talking about subcontracting a, a, a third party to do a penetration test on your facility they're going to ask questions about what's in scope am i allowed physical access right so if i can if i can get past your guards and gain physical access to your server room 
that's another form of a penetration test, just like it would be coming in over the network, trying to get through in through your firewalls or, or some other mechanism. What's the wildest example of a successful penetration of a sensitive asset? Stuxnet. It, it can be, it can be either, it can be from your experience or from something you've read. Stuxnet doesn't count because we already talked about it. <laughs> Anything but Stuxnet, what's the wild? And it, and it doesn't have to be like the most dangerous. It could also just be the weirdest or the most unexpected. And this is for both of you. Yeah. So when I, um, when I took ICS 410, uh, the guy that taught the class, uh, Justin actually talked about a penetration test he was on one time at a, a company and, and he, they basically had gotten in, gotten all the flags that, that the, uh, they were set up to get and they were a couple of days early. And so they're talking to the, the CIO on the way out. And he said, is there anything else, you know, you'd like us to try to do? And he goes, well, yeah, why don't you see if you can get into our data center? And, and his response back to him was your, your new data center or your old data center. He's like, how do you even know I have a new data center? <laughs> and so it started there, right? I'll save for sake of time. Um, the the long version but the short version they were leaving uh after a couple of after trying for a couple of different things and being unsuccessful and they thought hey you know it's the end of the day it's late on a friday let's see if we can get this guard to take us back to the data center i'm going to tell him i left my phone in there and we'll see if he'll walk us back there so they get to the, no. the guard they're talking they're signing out and he's like oh wait a minute i've left my phone oh man i left it in the data center is there any way you could get us back into the data center so i could get my phone out of the data center and the guard's like no i really can't and they're like, oh man, so close. Well, I'll, I'll just have to, and he goes, but, but wait a minute, we're about to change shifts. When the next guy comes in, I'll go ahead and let him take you down to the data center and get your phone while I sit here and wait. And then when y'all get back up, you know, you can, can move on. Long story short, sure enough, guard comes in. He's, he describes the process of getting down to the data center or trying to lead somebody to somewhere you don't really know where you're going. Right. So the whole time you're kind of falsifying this situation with this guard, you get to the door, the guard swipes his badge, can't get in. And the guard's like, oh, I don't have access to this. And the guy's like, oh, man, so close. He goes, tell you what, I'll be right back. I can just go add access to myself. So the guard oh, leaves them. Oh, no. You're part of the facility, goes and adds badge access to be able to get in, <laughs> comes back. And, and while they're gone, they're like, hey, he talked about like and skiing. So let's let's use that. Right. So when he gets up, you go ahead and talk about skiing somewhere close by and I'll go in, act like I found my phone, snap a couple of pictures so we can prove we've been here and we'll go. It works like a champ, but guard gets back, opens the door. I, I looked at, I looked at uh, Justin at the end of his description of all that. And I said, did you feel bad about getting those two guys fired? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyway, <clears throat> so that's one I of mean the craziest ones I've ever heard of. <sighs> There's so there's so much to that, <laughs> and and it's ninety nine percent of it is non technical. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, your penetration testing is certainly not always a technical process. It depends a lot on your ability to manipulate people as well. I want to ask for a pivot or an extension of this conversation, Larry, and it may be a little bit outside your wheelhouse um, from a from a hands on experience standpoint. But okay, so I, I'm interested in. IOT applications, health related. So I, I know um, this is a, a recency bias of mine, but I know that there are a lot of initiatives to leverage wearable health sensors for important, important things. And what are the security risks associated with um, wearable health sensors? Is it just limited to Wi-Fi connections or cell cellular connections or does it present a risk at all? Yeah, well, certainly it does it present a risk at all. So that's the first question you got to ask is this wearable biometric just sensing something about who I am, uh, in which case the risks are to your personal health information if it were to be compromised, but there's no risk to your physical well-being, I guess, for lack of a better way to put it. Um, but Today, you're going past that, right? We're, we're, we're actually embedding um, intelligent pacemakers where we can reprogram the pacemaker from outside the body, or we're actually using um, uh, insulin pumps that are automated essentially, right? And controlled through the cloud. So your phone essentially is, there's a sensor on your body, your phone's picking up your blood uh, sugar level from the sensor. You're making decisions either in the phone or in the cloud about how much insulin your body needs and it's adjusting the pump automatically. You know, in those kinds of situations now, I've got a threat vector where I could literally do somebody physical damage to their body um, through whatever that sensor might be. And 
it's not limited to just Wi-Fi, right? I mean, you're, it's going to be a wireless connection of some type. It could be Bluetooth, could be near field. It could be any one of a number of different wireless technologies. But it's kind of interesting because it's even presenting problems to the national security community. And what I mean by that is, have you ever thought about, you know, if you ever go into a, uh, a skiff, one of the things you have to do is take everything electronic off your body, right? So you put your phone in the lockbox, you put your smartwatch in the lockbox, you put whatever else you have. If you've got keys to a car that are more than a traditional RFI sensor or something like that, you throw those in the lockbox. Well, now all of a sudden you got people with wearables that are inside their body. I can't remove that device. Um, so what, you know, what risk does that even create from a, a national security perspective if, if in fact, that device was being used in a, a way that maybe we've never thought about that device being used before? So um, at least I've never thought about it, let's put it that way. Obviously, somebody was thinking about it. Um, so, yeah, it's it's definitely an issue. There's a couple of folks out there. One of them, a guy, guy by the name of Billy Rios, that's doing a lot of research in that space. Um, you, you guys might reach out to him if you want to have a conversation about it. I'm not an SME in that space by any means. I'm aware of the technologies. I'm aware of kind of what's going on, but you've probably reached the limit of my knowledge on the, on the, on that space. So let me ask a follow-up to that. Given what you just said, what are hardening strategies or mitigating strategies in this circumstance that are different or more, because I think the the level of uh, criticality is obviously higher. Well, <laughs> that's a that's a that's a philosophical question, an esoteric question. But the the level of criticality is certainly death versus just I lost I'm locked out of my bank account. Um, how do you? What are the hardening strategies in 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 a medical context versus an ICS? How are they similar? How are they different? Yeah. So I think number one, they're very similar from the perspective of the potential outcomes, right? I mean, an ICS, certainly death is a potential outcome of, of a compromise. Um, and honestly on a broader scale, right? Broader so, scale. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you think about a safety instrumented system in a refinery or something like that, right, that's a lot more people impacted than a single insulin pump on a single person. Not that that person is not important. I'm not in any way minimizing the risk. Unfortunately, from a personal perspective, there's not a lot I don't think an individual can really do other than make decisions not to use cloud enabled types of devices. Right. As you're having a conversation with your medical provider, if that's something that you're concerned about, you know, what are the what are the other options that give me the ability to still live a good quality of life without necessarily using an Internet connected or a wireless technology? Can I can I still get a pacemaker that you can't adjust from outside my body? Um, can I manage my own insulin pump, le you know, pump levels essentially without using some kind of a closed loop, put a man in the middle, make a suggestion about how much to inject without actually, you know, doing that injection. So those are the things I think an individual can do, um, back to what can be done on a broader scale. That's where secure software defined life cycles become so important. You know, there's been all this, um, conversations lately around software bill of materials and things of that nature and all the things that we should be doing from, a security perspective as we build software and as we deploy solutions and, and those kinds of things. And so that's, um, that's critical in the medical space, just like it's critical in the ICS space. Um, you know, the, there's definite uh, implications to all the decisions that we make around how we're going to design things. And it's just important to, uh, for, for vendors to really be thinking through that. How much of that is an afterthought in product development? Or, or a partial, a partial thought, yeah, which, so which product. A, yeah. Right. I mean, that, that's where you probably don't want the least expensive solution on the market for your problem. Right. I mean, and, and to even be fair, right. You, you, you got to be careful with even that because it may be the less, maybe the least expensive solution is the most secure just because they've actually put some thought into it. And the larger companies didn't think about it at all. Um, I would hope that's not the case, but, and I think there's probably less, chance for that today than there's been in the past. I mean, the beauty that you have on one level with medical devices is we don't have the 30 year history that we have in ICS, right? I'm, I've got a long list of legacy technologies that are out there that we've been running that we got to figure out how to integrate with. I have challenges from an availability perspective and how I might architect a network or things of that nature on the ICS side. Whereas on the med device side, most of this stuff is brand new. Uh, and so it's really making sure that that uh, and that's why there's a lot of, of legislation coming down, essentially, you know, enforcing 
secure software defined life cycles, things of that nature in that medical device space. Um, it's kind of interesting, actually. Um, ISA is trying hard to push some of the six two four four three four two stuff essentially in the med device space, right? Let's let's make sure that people are doing the right thing from a hardware software design perspective when in, in anything that looks like OT, right? Whatever that might be. So our and my last question, and I'll I'll yield to to Russ for the rest of the the time here. Sure I'll, defer, <laughs> I'll defer to the prosecutor. Um, in medical devices, aren't um, communications protocols like Zigbee or Bluetooth, whatever they're designed with, aren't there supposed to be like hardening um, or security protocols embedded in those in Zigbee or Bluetooth or whatever the connectivity is to the device? Uh, how much does that help or is there still a, a threat vector or surface area from the app or the, the cloud-based connection that communicates with the device? Yeah. So you really have two different attack vectors for something that's cloud-based for an example, right? The first one would be the actual communication path between the device and however I'm getting to the cloud. That might be the Bluetooth protocol, the, the Zigbee protocol, the actual Wi-Fi or whatever it is that you might be doing. The second is in, is infiltrating the actual application in the cloud, right? Causing it to make a decision. I've got a legitimate request, and now I'm going to modify the response uh, in the cloud. So there's the two quick places that that you have essentially for trying to manipulate a process. To your point, there's a lot that's been done with Bluetooth, not so much Zigbee, um, and others essentially to try to build security into the protocol stack, build encryption into the protocol stack, make sure that we're doing the right things from an authentication perspective. Uh, is it perfect? No. Is it better than it was? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people that'll tell you that, you know, one of the challenges with with TCP has been, right, that we, we never built it with security in mind. We built it to get two things to talk quickly and do it efficiently. And now we're having to do all these other things to essentially you know, TLS wrap a payload and so on and so forth to try to build some security into what we're doing. It would be an interesting, and I'm sure somebody's doing this right now. I don't really, I'm not aware of who it would be an interesting thought process. You know, what's going on in the um, national lab community, essentially around, maybe we just think differently about the entire solution end to end. Let's start with a secure wireless interface of some kind. Let's not use, you know, TCP. Let's build a new uh, protocol stack and do it entirely around security for medical devices, maybe as a, as a launching point. Um, I would, you know, that would be a, a really interesting conversation maybe for some other people that are closer to, to what's going on in the space. Cause I could see that being the one place that you might actually be able to fund that. And then once you kind of get it funded, now you can take what you developed and you can leverage it in other spaces like ICS or IOT or other things, right? Uh, you got to find that high value location to actually build the technology stack and then move it out from there. It's like, it's like safety um, and all the safety standards. You're one of the things that's repeated over and over and over again. This is, this came up a lot in robotics as you went from robots that were fenced off in a cage to robots that ostensibly could have a person uh, side by side with the robot so the sort of cobot shifts but the safety standards in the the safety community talked about there is no such thing as a safe robot there's a safe implementation um, or a safe deployment so it's similar terry in your case i think there is there is no safe protocol there's a there's a or there's no secure protocol there's a secure implementation or a more secure implementation yeah how do you like that for a non-answer <laughs> I think it's a good you. answer. It's back, actually. It's back on you, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I'm just the hype guy. I'm yeah. just Steve Ballmer in the developers conference with the well, sweaty armpits. <laughs> so we, I mean, we started with, we started <clears throat> sort of wondering out loud whether this is a space where a mere mortal should be dabbling in security research, and unfortunately, the answer is yes. Um, and then we talked a little bit about how that would work to not get my bank account details stolen. Um, and then we moved on to parallels between um, healthcare devices versus industrial devices or, or biometric uh, versus industrial. And, I, you know, I feel like the, the glue that ties it all together is, are we, are we just repeating the same story? You know, Larry, you were talking about uh, we have 30 years of legacy in ICS. 30 years from now, are we going to have 30 years of legacy in pacemakers and we have exactly the same problems that we're 
that we're dealing with now for you know power plants how does how does the story end does the story end speculate for me oh terry's yeah, waiting. he's got to so, take care yeah so maybe pulling some things out of that i know that are going on from a national lab perspective there's something of um, cyber informed engineering or consequence driven cyber informed engineering and we're trying really hard to take those concepts and turn them into curriculum that we can push into ABET programs. So imagine a civil engineer or mechanical engineer or an electrical engineer or programmer getting the concepts of, of security built into the program as they go through the process of becoming who they are. So I'm, I'm hopeful that 30 years from now, we're not having this conversation because we've changed the mindset. You know, you, you think about, you know, Russ, you mentioned, um, the, the, uh, sec- the safety in robots, right? I mean, safety culture as a whole in industry has changed so much over the last 20 years, right? 20, 30 years ago, probably a little bit uh, out there, but, you know, we kind of depended on the Darwin principle to keep people from doing things that they shouldn't do, right? Okay. Today, we guard and, and gate everything in an attempt to try to, uh, to go the other side. Have we gone too far? Maybe, but you don't hardly start a meeting in a large company anymore without a safety minute. I think when we start building security into that and get that same mindset from a cybersecurity perspective, then 30 years from now, we're not having this conversation about not just med devices, but all the other aspects of how technology touches our lives, artificial intelligence, what we're doing in AI ML, right? So I want to, I hope I want to ask one more question. I apologize. I want to ask you, Larry, to put on your, your, your wizardly crystal ball hat and if we're looking 30 years into the future, whether it's ICS, whether it's medical device, whatever the technology that we're trying to protect, are the gains that, uh, where's innovation? Is there a new way to push data around or a new way to connect to devices that's being studied that may be mature in 30 years? Or are we done? Are we done with protocols and in technologies, like it's just implementation or is there something else? Yeah. So God, I hope we're not done because we're, we, if we are, we're in deep trouble because we done. don't have good <laughs> solutions for that. Right. No. I mean, you've even got, you even got quantum computing coming along, basically ready to take every form of encryption that we currently use and make it utterly useless. So, you know, 30 years from now, it'll be a completely different mantra from what we've got today. I'm, I'm fairly certain. Um, I think the the challenge is really to, you know, how do we innovate? How do we encourage? I made the comment about, you know, if you're going to build something, a new protocol stack, maybe you do it out of med devices because trying to do it out of other places, you may not be able to get the funding to make it happen. I mean, how did we get a lot of the technology that we've got today? I, I think you can chase a lot of it back to the space program, right? I mean, a lot of what happened, triple, you can, you can credit Apollo for TMR, you can credit Apollo for ERP, you can credit a uh, Apollo for a lot of things that today we take for granted. And it was funded based on somebody's vision to get man on the moon. Um, you know, what's the, what's the next space race for us in terms of, of, um, causing people to innovate and think differently. I, I don't know the answers to those questions, uh, by any means, but, you know, like I said earlier, I hope there's somebody in some labs thinking about it, uh, for sure. Well, you got us thinking about it. Terry's <laughs> going to go build safe pacemakers and I'm going to go keep chipping honey away. <laughs> Let's do it. I'm, I'm going to go chip away at my honey pot. Larry, thanks a ton for coming back. I look forward to the next time we talk to you and I can tell you all the filthy, filthy things that got into my honey pot. <laughs> this is a family program. I'm looking forward to hearing that, Russ. <laughs> Thank Bye you, Larry. You guys. Bye guys. Hey, ho.